<clears throat> in 2005, I was in a plane that crashed on Catalina Island, just off the coast of Southern California. Two friends and I, one who was a pilot, decided that we were going to go out, enjoy a nice flight to Catalina, and have lunch on the island. We jumped into Piper at the local flight club, which he was a part of, and took off. The flight there was great. We had lunch and began our return, while flying over the Pacific at 5,000 feet, halfway between Catalina and Long Beach. The propeller suddenly stopped spinning. I was sitting in the co-pilot's seat. Seeing the propeller stop was a scary sight. The pilot stayed calm. He pushed some buttons. I think he was switching to a reserve tank. And the propeller started back up. Phew. We're good, I thought. About 30 seconds later, it stopped again. This is when I got a bit nervous. The pilot turned around, began communication with the flight tower back on Catalina Island, and informed him of the situation and that we were returning. The pilot ensured us that we were high enough and close enough to glide back. If you've never flown into Catalina, the airport is on top of a cliff. The runway is super short, and both ends are cliff sides. As we got closer, the pilot cut off the speaker and switched communications with the tower to headphones. I could see he was getting a bit nervous. Shortly after, we could see the runway. We were coming in way too high. Once we reached the runway, the pilot began to do S-turns to slow us down, about three or four of them before nosediving into the ground. We were not that high above ground, maybe a hundred feet. We hit at about a 45 degree angle from the ground, nose first. The impact was intense. My head struck the co-pilot yoke and we skid to a halt. As I looked up, the windshield was covered in dirt on the outside and blood on the inside. My first thought was that blood came gushing from my forehead when it hit the yoke. I looked over at the pilot. His lower lip was split in half. The blood was his. At this point, I noticed an extreme pain in my back and began moaning. My friend who was in the back seat asked if everyone was okay. I told him my back was fucked. But from here, both my friends jumped out of the plane, went around to my door and opened it. One of them started checking to see if I could feel my limbs by pinching my toes fingers, etc. I could, and that was a relief, but my back was definitely injured badly. They helped me out of the plane and laid me flat on the ground. A helicopter eventually showed up and flew me back to the hospital in Long Beach. My friends suffered minor injuries and stayed on the island. I ended up with a compression fracture on two vertebrae, L1 and L2, and a nice scar on my forehead from the impact on the yoke. The doctor decided surgery was not necessary. I ended up wearing an upper body shell, think turtle shell, for the next three to six months. I can't remember exactly how long, but it felt like an eternity. A hospital bed was delivered to my house, and that was where I laid 90% of the time until I fully recovered. There was never a point where I thought, alright, this is it. In my head, we were going to glide back, land the plane, and take a boat back. All was groovy. By the time I realized we were going down, the pilot was doing S turns and we hit the ground. It felt like it happened in a split second. I've posted this story before in a similar thread, but I was in a small plane crash during skydive operations a few years ago. Just after takeoff, we lost power. We were heading directly at a Walmart, at around 600 feet and losing altitude. The pilot made an abrupt 90 degree turn to the left. I originally thought we were turning sharply to avoid other traffic, or that air control had vectored us off for some reason, but quickly realized the engine was stopping. The left wing dipped pretty sharply as he put the flaps down, and I ended up looking down into the parking lot of an abandoned grocery store. I remember thinking that if we came down in that parking lot, the light posts would probably act like cheese graters to our plane. The jumper in front of me, who was sitting with his back to the dash, looked over to the pilot who confirmed we were in trouble, and then back at us and told us to brace for impact. The pilot was aiming for a small grass lot behind a gas station. Unfortunately, we didn't clear the power lines, or the pull itself. I didn't have my seatbelt on, or my helmet, and I was trying to decide if I wanted to try and buckle, or put my helmet on. I realized there wasn't going to be any time, and I just tried to brace myself by grabbing the door frame. 
I felt the tandem instructor in back grab the back of my rig. I knew I was probably dead. I wasn't scared, but I was incredibly disappointed. I never expected that I'd actually die skydiving. Or ever, really. The last thing I remember seeing before I bounced off the roof of the plane was the right wing skipping off a wooden pole as it splintered. I was all groggy for a bit, but it came to hitting over the pilot's seat. The door had popped open and thrown him into the ground, then swung back shut over his legs. We had to kick it out and walk over his chest to get out, but we went back and tried to drag him away from the plane. We had just filled up, and a full load of fuel was pouring all over the parking lot we had just landed in. Having just hit a power line, we just assumed it was going to blow up. We brushed our hands off him and went back into the plane to get his hat and some documents. He seemed completely unfaced for having just crash landed a plane through a power pole. We all got away with nothing more than a few bruises and a minor concussion. I stopped jumping for about 16 months. The drop zone closed down. It was purchased by a different owner, got a new plane and reopened. I started jumping again shortly afterwards. I survived a plane crash, but I think you'd be disappointed with the story. It was not a commercial aircraft, but rather a World War I replica. The incident occurred shortly after takeoff, where I encountered intense wind shear and attempted to get the airplane back down to land in the grass. There was not enough aileron authority to lift the left wing. The hard right rudder prevented a complete rollover, which is what I was imagining was about to happen. However, I did impact left wing down. Luckily for me, the wing folded up, preventing a cartwheel. On impact, my seat literally broke in half. Half inch chromoly tubing. I smashed into the instrument panel with enough force to actually push some instruments out the back side. People ask me what was going through my mind. Really, it happened so fast. And I was so concentrated on preventing the airplane from rolling over on its back that I didn't think about much. I've heard people ask World War II fighter pilots what they were thinking when engaged in a dogfight, and most of them say that they were far too busy and concentrated to think of death. I was the same way that day. I didn't lose consciousness and was indeed able to extract myself from the wreckage. I was spewing a generous amount of blood from somewhere, so I asked the person on the scene how bad my injuries looked. He couldn't even open his mouth and had a look of terror about him. I thought, oh geez, this can't be good. I was transported to the hospital for treatment. Turns out, I had a shattered vertebrae, burst fracture, and was in danger of being paralyzed. Splinters of bone were flowing dangerously close to his spinal canal. I was not paralyzed, luckily, but ended up in a brace for a few months. I took a nasty blow to the head. It was the lacerations that generated so much blood. Head lacerations always bleed a lot. I had a few other injuries, many of which I don't remember. I think I cut my arm on something. A representative from the NTSB came to visit me in the hospital just a couple hours after it happened. My wife refused to allow him to interview me in the hospital, and she asked if the interview could be conducted later. He said that was fine, and I did do a phone interview with him a few days later. The NTSB guy was really nice and considerate, not something you usually encounter when dealing with the FAA slash NTSB. The long-term effects are minimal. I am a half inch shorter now. I have bad back pain sometimes, but not enough to require medication. I have a really bad scar about two inches long on my forehead. I still enjoy aviation immensely, having recently returned from the EAA Air Venture in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. That's about it. And so that concludes the stories for tonight. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I wanted to post this yesterday, but my software just kept acting up and I couldn't finish it. So sorry about that. If you guys have any true stories that you would like for me to read, just go ahead and send them to my email. I'll leave the link, uh, uh, somewhere. And yeah, I think I'll be doing like a bloopers video next week or something. I don't know. Would you guys like that? Let me know in the comment section below. So yeah, I made a schedule a few days ago, and uh, I'm gonna try and stick to it as far as making videos goes. And uh, just expect more from me. But yeah, thank you guys so much for viewing the video, and I will check you guys later. Peace out.